<clears throat> well, thanks very much. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I would have liked to have been here yesterday. Uh, so um, I, I did have a, the opportunity to have uh, uh, discussions with uh, one of my colleagues, Steve Ferguson, who was copiously taking notes, and he's provided me with some of his thoughts. So I'm going to be reflecting some of what he he thought as he listened to some of the talks yesterday, as well as uh, give you some of the overview from the standpoint of the National Toxicology Program. And I'm glad that you uh, covered question two because you're the only one that's covering, gonna cover question two, I think, this, this yeah. <laughs> on this panel currently. But uh, so I'm gonna be talking mainly about question one. And just to uh, reflect on some of the things that you heard yesterday, clearly there have been remarkable advances in, uh, in this whole field. The models that are presented are obviously more complex biologically than the earlier static models of, uh, of uh, 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 less complex uh, uh, than the tissues on the chip. The, the fact that you have dynamic systems now is an incredible advance in terms of potentially mimicking a diverse array of toxicities that could be in, occurring in humans. There's clearly an improved ability to uh, employ varying ex exposure scenarios in these kind of situations. One can potentially study um, various chemical mixtures that one could not necessarily study in a static culture system. You can add them sequentially. You can uh, adjust the timing of these additions and, and get a lot more information out of it. Um, there's better preservation of xenobiotic metabolism, clearly. Um, and there's also the effects or the ability to look at the effects of uh, toxicants that accumulate with time. There's the ability to assess volatile compounds in a closed flow through system, which we don't have. This is a real problem with the current efforts uh, that the NTP and NCATS and the TOX21 program uh, face. Um, there's the ability, obviously, to, to assess the interactions of a variety of of organ systems, as many as you can put on a chip, potentially you could uh, look at the interactions of those organ systems. And the ability to also incorporate more uh, complex physiological parameters, um, oxygen tension, physical flow rates, things of that nature. One of the things that is most troublesome about the whole in vitro culturing systems that we're using across the board is the fact that we're not using uh, realistic oxygen tensions. These are done primarily in cells that tend to grow well in cultures in 21% oxygen. That's not physiological, and, that's, and, and we're obviously, when we look at oxidative stress in these cells, these cells are already adapted quite, quite well for, to that situation, so we have problems in that area. So this, the potential for using these at, at realistic oxygen uh, tensions is, I think, a, a great advantage. And it's been mentioned, the possibility of developing disease models and assessing uh, broader uh, population ranges of responses is also a great advantage. And overall, it, you know, it really raises uh, exciting possibilities in overcoming these species-specific problems that we've had with respect to extrapolating toxicology results and also in the, the drug safety assessment arena. So there's, as I see it, clear applications in the pharmaceutical industry now. Um, but the questions that the NTP faces are somewhat different. Um, many of you probably know that our mission has been changing over the years. We're moving away from the study of individually highly toxic or moderately toxic compounds that are identified using the traditional toxicology models, really more towards identifying and prioritizing large functional and structural classes of chemicals to try to, to prioritize chemicals for further in-depth study. We have a large effort in evaluating low-dose effects in endocrine active organs and uh, trying to get our hands around the, the, the huge problem of trying to understand whether all of the low-dose effects that are being reported in, in many of the studies that we are actually supporting through our grant system are actually of producing information that is relevant in the human situation. And as, as we uh, gather more and more information uh, from epidemiology studies, there seems to be quite a bit more support for the fact that these very, very low-dose endocrine active agents are, in fact, uh, p potentially causing public health problems. Uh, in addition, we've begun to study and identify uh, genetic determinants 
that underlie variability of response using models such as the diversity outbred mouse. So we really, we find ourselves developing interests in identifying molecular signatures of these sort of traditional toxicants or endocrine active agents with the idea that we would be able to produce predictive models that we could then use to prioritize these thousands of unstudied chemicals. And to do this <clears throat> in our hands in the TOX21 program, we're looking at very, very early acute cellular responses in vitro that may be predictive of long-term adverse outcomes. And we're doing this by in these high-throughput screens that I'm sure Rusty talked about yesterday and have, have come up in, the, in other venues, using hopefully metabolically capable, generally human cells, and developing the ability to look at high-content uh, transcriptomic-based readouts that re will result ultimately in pathway-based signatures that have incredible complexity. Um, now, it's already come up on the slide that was shown earlier, Yvonne's slide, that the tissue on a chip could be a bridge technology between, uh, in, a, in sort of a tiered approach between high-throughput screening and the long-term animal studies, or it could be applied after identifying an agent in a long-term animal study to try to help you understand the human relevance of those particular findings. But there are a lot of limitations to these uh, systems, as, as have been discussed at length yesterday. The throughput is a problem. Uh, reproducibility and standardization of the models, uh, and there's an awful lot of work that's needed to understand the predictiveness of these assays with respect to uh, 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 developing or predictiveness for, a pro uh, for specific phenotypes in higher organisms or in uh, humans, for example. So one aspect I think that has probably been discussed a little bit but hasn't maybe been discussed as much as I'd like to see is that um, one of the things that would affect the way we would use these models is that the endpoints that are studied in these high through, in these uh, 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 tissue on a chip models uh, are generally looking at functional or metabolic outputs that are evaluated in the circulating media. And this, this really um, is, puts it in a, in, a, in a different sense than looking at a, at a genomic response in a high throughput screen where you've got a, a very rapid response of a cell. Um, and, in, and then a phenotypic outcome in an animal, which is kind of the other, the other end of the, of the spectrum here. So you're looking at the middle and you're looking at a, at, at a, at a measurement that is not exactly related to, to either. It's sort of a biomarker of an, of an early, of, of a, of a, a biomarker of an early phenotypic event. So that's going to actually complicate, I think, the, the bridging activity somewhat. So as I said, uh, there are also issues with the sensitivity, the reproducibility, the relevance of these responses of these tissues on a chip. Um, these are, of course, no different than for any assay, even those that we've been dealing with for decades. So that's not uh, that unusual. But as we would expect them to be fairly good, we still need to make sure that, in fact, they are uh, uh, telling us what we expect that they're telling us. And all that said, I think that uh, the tissues on a chip results would be placed, if replaced in the correct context, as I mentioned, as in this bridging uh, uh, theory here, um, and if there was reasonable cohesiveness in the biology that was being represented in high throughput screening and phenotypic outcome and in these, and in these tissue chip models, I think it would certainly increase our confidence that there was biological relevance, human biological relevance, if you're dealing with a human tissue on a chip, uh, in that there might be something that needs to be done about a particular chemical from a public health standpoint. Um, the key word, I think, in the first question is confidence. And we're spending an awful lot of time in the National Toxicology Program now trying to understand how we can quantify confidence and try to make it clear as to what we mean by confidence and how much confidence we have in associating a particular environmental exposure with a, with a public health outcome. So I think that's, a, that's as close to risk assessment as we get. Um, that's as close as I'd like to get, actually. <laughs> um, but it's a very important uh, concept that I think uh, could 
uh, will be expanded upon in the in the discussions this morning. So with that, I'll take questions. Thank you very much, John. Any quick questions before we go on to our fourth speaker? Okay, um, Frank Weischold with U.S. Uh, Food and Drug Administration, thank you very much for joining us. And if you'd like to just, we're, what we're doing is just giving a few brief comments before we open it up to discussion. <laughs> 